The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Promise to pay you, and what do you promise to do for 
made. So referring back to that, to represent you in two hours. There's only a few hours that you represent me in this whole thing. You, you, you hired, hired Wigan and Nury, sir. I'm one of the lawyers that Wigan and Nury worked for. You're the one that I hired. You were the hired president of Wigan and Nury. You hired my firm, which is very clearly set forth in this fee agreement. Someone uh, signed this document 
you forged your name to it in August of 2007? I've never seen this document. And I guarantee you, you can't pull a signature that I've done, any one out of a thousand, that looks even close to that. Can you look at page number one, or exhibit one, please, sir? Page one. Yep. This is a letter dated July 18, 2007, from Attorney Ross, addressed to you as personal and confidential at 69 Conjure Road, Road, Is that what it says? Let's say it. Is that your address? Was that your address in 2007? It's still my address. Did you receive this letter? No. Not that I recall. And listen, you see that signature? You've got my signature on a thousand. Tell me if it's close. Uh, yeah, we have a sidebar conference just with Mr. Gilbert here as well. Uh, well, the, the last question was, uh, he had not seen the document before. He said he never received it. Would you like a copy of my driver's license, Mr. Hilliard, so you can match up the signature to find out we're not even in the right ballpark? So, Mr. Gill, is your testimony under oath that you did not receive the July 18, 2007 letter? What I'm saying you? is, what you just showed me here, I never signed. And the signature you're showing here, which could be clear to all the jurors, if you'd like to put multiple copies of my signature, to see if this is my signature. Did you receive the letter? I have no memory of this letter. And I'm telling you, that is a forgery. In fact, let me take a look. Let's check in the signatures of the people who did sign it. Because it looks like they used the same pen. And if you would have mailed it to me, then I wouldn't have it signed yet, would I? Would you like a copy of my driver's license to verify the uh, signature? I just want to confirm that you're denying under oath before this jury. Under oath, I'm telling you this is a forgery, flat out. And you also deny receiving one. Right. That I have any recall of, of receiving this. This would have been seven years ago. But I'm telling you this. I did not sign this. So this fee agreement, so forth, is a forgery. Look at the you know what? My business is checking forgeries. I run a mortgage company. And you know something? Take a look at the pen who wrote it and the pen there. It's not your signature. I think I made that clear, haven't I? It was not signed on your behalf by... Excuse me? It was not signed on your behalf Absolutely not. Why would I? Doesn't it say they witnessed it? says at the bottom, read, approved, and accepted, and there's a line for signature by Michael J. Gill and a date. Pretty clear to me, and that's not my signature. Right. Let me ask you a little bit to the two for a moment. Are we all down at one? Uh, for the moment. That's awesome. Is there the two? Mr. Gill, and I'm focused on eight number four, and then go to the right hand corner of page number four, and the entry of July 30, 2007. See that one? Yes. It's an entry by DSS, which is Attorney Sedgwick, conference with Michael Gill and Attorney Brock. I remember it clearly. So you did attend a meeting with attorneys Ross and Sedgwick on July 30, 2007. Wrong. Right? Now you want me to explain it to you? I met with Mrs. Ms. Ross. We were in a conference room with all glass. Miss, Mr. Ross came by, knocked on the window, and called her out. The door opened, it didn't close quite. And what Mr. Ross said to her, don't get close. You know what we have to do. When she came back in, that was the beginning of, of, of me putting a lot of, be very curious about what's going on. So it was that meaning exactly. 
Ms. Sedgwick testified to that.
bill, and these bills are under tab two or two, two. These bills each month contain an itemization of the date, the activity, and the person who performed it and the amount of time. Is that right? Yes. Did you review these bills when you received them? No. I take it then you didn't review them, you didn't raise any questions or concerns about the activity or the time or the amount of the bill. Is that correct? The amount of the bills I thought was excessive. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands to get the board that turned out to five million I thought was excessive. But what got me upset was when I found from, from attorney uh, Sedgwick that it was all fraud and that he was bringing in his friend in to play catch. Right, the last part of the right. He didn't question. And in fact, you paid, did you not, Mr. Gill, the August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March bills. Is that right? Right, until I found out what Mrs. Sedgwick told me. And then I immediately moved Dallas Watch for a malpractice case and into Boston for a malpractice case against Mr. Ross and then terminated him. So the answer, is, folks, is yes. Right. Next. You received the bill for the work that William and Nori did on your behalf in April of 2008, sometime in the earlier middle of May. Is that right? I don't recall that, but I got a bill every month. And the bill for May, excuse me, the bill in May for time in April uh, is on page 79 of our material. something that doesn't exist. 
exists. You brought up the law firms. Your Honor, I approached the bench for the sole reason that the last thing he said was someone had made an offer of settlement and he pointed to Mr. Ross as if to suggest that that is Don't tell him. 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 Don't t
I will not let her testify. Okay. But that means that door number two. Or that means you can just close door number one. That means that you cannot call her tomorrow. Right. She's done. Right. Okay. Door number two is I'll hear her now, and if you can convince me that she has something personal and relevant to offer the jury, I'll order her back tomorrow to give that testimony. So if you say no, they never hear it. That's right. Is there a three door? No, there's no three door. But if you if you call her in and have her testify, then you have a record for your appeal. I already have. So you're saying I only have those options, and I have to make that decision right now. I have ten minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. You, so what are you going to learn in 10 minutes that you don't know now? Well, you've thought about this before, obviously. You know, right, case. and I'm bringing her in after Walker spoke, after Tober spoke. I want them to incriminate themselves. But they can still do that. Well, what, what's her testimony going to do with any of that? Well, no, she doesn't testify. You're saying this is testifying there. This doesn't impact the jury. The jury should hear what she has to say. Okay, and they may. If she has something relevant to say, I'm going to let them. I'm not saying you can't call her. I'm just saying you've got to put her on first to make sure that she only has relevant evidence. Well, that's on the grounds, I'm sorry, Ron? Yeah, on the grounds that if you were an attorney, okay, I would ask you if there's any, wit if there's any witness that is offered as a witness before a jury. Well, judges, sure. judges look at and what Why we call is she it, different? No, it's not different. Let me just, again, this is the setup is this. If there's a witness that uh, is suggested by either party and they want to call, the other party has the right to request me to uh, request what we call an offer of proof. I'm not going to call her. I'll have her speak to the feds instead. I'll have them lie on the witness stand. Okay, so she's not off here. She's not on the witness stand. That's fine. She's not going to be called a witness. That's fine. The next question is, you have the expert for Maine tomorrow? Yes. Okay. What else do you have in terms of tomorrow? I have, I, learning from today, I have the uh, Mr. Tober being notified for tomorrow. Okay, now you, you, somebody's calling him? Right. I'm asking the court. We're going to be calling Mr. Tober? Yes. But who's going to notify Mr. Who's going to notify Mr. Tober? My paralegal. Okay. I'm doing that right now. Okay. Uh, Mr. You hear that okay? What you just saw is a judge committing fraud. What he did was inform all our witnesses that it had to be a court order that he would order their presence, not me asking them. I'm going to show you a subpoena, one after another, squashed by these attorneys. And McHugh, right here, right then, set us up for them not to come in, so we would have no witnesses. Walking down the middle, Mr. Walker's on Monday, first day. I mean, Wednesday, you mean? Wednesday, right. And okay. tomorrow, the uh, building expert will be the first. First day. Yeah, for that's, that's, that's the job. Uh, and then we'll try to fit in Mr. Wise, Mr. Tober, Mr. Schroff, and I'd like to be able to get Jennifer Rasmussi tomorrow. Now, they've all been notified. Okay, I'm leaving that with you because they're your witnesses. I'm on. And the first witness is going to be the gentleman from Maine, the expert. I already had the questions over now. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, 10 o'clock tomorrow. Very good. 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you. All rise, please. I went home after court thinking about that forgery. And why? And I figured it out. It was more of a release than a fee agreement. They knew from the very beginning they were going to commit fraud. That's why it's forged. And the forgery itself. A third grader could forge my signature, unfortunately. This wasn't even close. How could they even make such a mistake? You know why? 
It was the first document you would have had signed. They didn't know my signature. And then there was the insistence of the mailing. Why that? It's because he couldn't say that he saw me witness it. Because if it is a forgery, he would have been lying and he could have been trapped. These guys are pretty difficult to put in a corner. So he says these mails it. Are we to assume, now that we know it's a forgery, somebody went in my mailbox, took out that document, forged it, signed it, and mailed it back to them? They were in financial trouble. They couldn't take a chance for me to read this agreement and say, what the hell is this? That's why it was forged. And you know who forged it? And we have many figures proving it. It was Dollar Sedgwick herself. So they worked in conjunction together. In fact, if you look at the fee agreement, it refers to one other document. And we have that document. And guess what? That's the forgery too. By the same person, clearly. Well, then it hit me. They're going to have a mistrial. They can't keep going. I went to court this next morning, as you're looking at right now, knowing that they were going to kill this case right then and there. They had to shut us off, and that was it. Watch what happens. The Honorable Court is in session. Oops, we need to leave. Mr. Gill, can I call you next witness, please? Well, I'm going to call myself, Your Honor, but I want to... Well, when you, when you, when you can't do that. You testified yesterday. You're done. Well, no, 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 I didn't testify. I was cross-examined. You gave a statement first. No, no, that wasn't a statement. Well, I don't know what it was, but you were on the stand. You can't... Listen, you can't we just back. presented a forged document yesterday. I did not testify. I did not... And it wasn't clear that you told me that I was testifying. Because that we would have had an issue. The first thing I want to do is testify to what Mr. Hilliard interviewed me about. No, the, the way this works is you have one opportunity to take the stand. And Mr. Ross can't come back either, by the way. Well, wait a minute. I, I, was, I didn't testify. I didn't make a statement. Mr. Hilliard asked me questions. I, swore, I have to I swore you win. I swore you win. And I said, Tell them what you want to tell them, and you made a statement. Well, you didn't tell me that was my 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 statement. The statement was my uh, testimony. Who would you think it was? You already made an open statement. statement. How about this, Mr. Gill? Your testimony. Mr. Hillian cross-examined me. I would like to make this my evidence. Your Honor, this is... He just presented a forged document that I can clearly prove was forgery. And then we can go on why they forged it. I never saw this document. I can make a statement now, Your Honor. You, you can make a closing statement, I suppose. You have one more shot at them. You can make a oh, this is, this, I'm telling you, I believe this is criminal. I believe you didn't make it very clear to me there was this. Mr. Hilliard, Ask me a question. We only have two parts of evidence, the bills and that agreement. The signature is so far off in this agreement, it is comical. You know why? It's the first agreement I would have signed with them. They didn't know my signature. Why? You remember Mr. Mr. Ross testifying? We don't make any promises. I was a multi-millionaire. They were in a recession. They right. took that with the intent of making millions and not having me go after them. I never saw that document. Now, you want to know? He said that he mailed it. Your Honor. It was the same pen. Can we stop for a minute? Okay. What's, your, what's your position on this? I, I object to everything that's going on, Your Honor. It's inappropriate, and I'd like to uh, make a motion outside the presence of the jury. Come for a minute. I want, I want to tell you this, I want a, a order right now to have that document preserved. And I would like that document in the courtroom tomorrow. You're both going to find out that Mr. Ross signed that document. And the reason why that was that they did what? That was signed by the same pen. That document was in only one person's control. Wiggins and Norrie. Who signed the document? He did. Want to bet that's his signature? 
So the first act in this whole divorce was fraud, was forging my name because they knew they were going to rob us. It's that simple. The same pen signed the agreement. And you can see it's not mine. They never saw my signature. This whole, and the piece of evidence was the bill and this. They are trying to get Mr. Ross off on a mistrial right now. I want you to know that's what's going on because we caught them bold. Talk for a minute. And I want a preservation order on that agreement. That is the principal part of their evidence. And it's fraud and it's forgery and they know we can prove it. What motion do you want to make? I make a motion, Your Honor, that the court exercises discretion in view of Mr. Gill's continued violation, disobeying, ignoring of your orders and admonitions that this trial, particularly now, has become so tainted that the court should enter an order. The court has done this before in similar circumstances, relying on the Lily Pitts case in 160 New Hampshire within the discretion to dismiss his counterclaims. Dismiss the claim. You presented a forgery in this court, and you know it. Like I said, they were going to do it. They presented a forged document. I want that original here tomorrow. There is no way I signed it, and they know it signed it. I would like to present as evidence my, my signature on my passport and credit card. I'd like the jury to be able to match that up against the signature. Why not? They presented that as evidence. You get me to a very narrow scope. Just numbers. Just the numbers. They spent all that time on that agreement. See? We don't make any promises. Well, I promise you I didn't see it. And guess what? They do make promises. We'll get your kids back. Don't worry about it. You think they're going to say, hey, we don't know how many millions you're going to spend? The intent was to do this. I say we have an expert over that signature and we're going to find out it's Mr. Ross's signature. So we have a forged document by Mr. Ross that was impossible for me to sign. Why he said he mailed it? Because he can't say he saw me sign it because that would be, if it was proven to be a forgery, that's why he said he had it mailed. It's this, this is as simple as simple gets. And let's make it clear that you're trying to get a uh, dismissal on this, on that case, which is what I said from the very beginning. I'm going to issue a uh, law and order in this case, having in mind what's happened over the past couple of days, but I am going to dismiss this litigation. You receive long order and then you can appeal it. Is that so you right? did this. Didn't I call it? From one. I hope you guys watch this video. This is a very big you fish you and they can't have you all live clips. That's exactly what I said was going to happen. You witnessed the truth today. Look at that video and tell me. Find out if the judge isn't included too. I'm just going to ask you for a few moments of your time. I want you to read through and look through the statement that Dallas Sedgwick made in front of three attorneys and myself in writing. And you're going to see them one at a time. Please read them. And I want to show you another document. See, they don't want to tell you how many times they were involved in malpractice. In 2010, they were in the case of federal fraud. Now, in closing, I want to have you just one sentence that Dallas Sedgwick put in a letter. It would be much easier for me to walk away altogether and done with this entire mess. But I want to expose them and what has gone on. I feel obligated to do so. This impacted me too. This fraud affects all of us.
please do not miss the importance of who these people are. Your U.S. attorney calls John Ross his mentor. Judge LaPlante calls him his mentor. Hilliard is the president of the New England Bar Association. These are the big guys. You just saw them. You saw that Judge McHugh, which I said up front, was corrupt. You tell me if you see Judge McHugh differently, and he's not corrupt. It would be much easier for me to walk away altogether and be done with the entire mess, but I want to expose what has gone on. I feel obligated to do so. I learned that Steve Tober would be adverse counsel. I knew Tober as he represented Wigan and Norrie and had even represented me personally on a sensitive matter. I also knew that Tober was very close to Ross, that the two were good friends, and that Tober had previously represented Ross. From the time Tober first appeared in the case, his litigation tactics were extremely aggressive. Tober took a scorched earth approach. Tober's approach would be to excessively bill the divorce case, all of which would unnecessarily lead to increased legal fees for Gil and depletion of the marital estate. Eventually, it would become clear to me that the goal of Ross and Tober collectively was to extract considerable legal fees out of a once sizable marital estate. In December 2007, Gil became uneasy with Ross as his attorney. I recall numerous telephone calls and in-person conversations with Gil where he informed me that he was not comfortable with Ross as his attorney. I told Ross early on that there was a conflict of interest given the aforementioned legal representations and relationships. I then directed an associate, Megan Beauregard, to perform legal research on the ethical issues involving conflicts of interest. Following our research, I concluded that a material conflict of interest existed and that we needed to disclose the same to the client. At the time, I did not know, but would soon learn from my associate conducting the legal research, that Ross, too, had been represented by Tober in cases involving ethical and legal malpractice violations. Given the above, I prepared a motion to disqualify Tober as attorney for Mr. Gill's wife in the divorce. The basis of the motion was the aforementioned conflicts of interest, the overall impropriety, and the potential significant compromise of the client's interests in a hotly contested divorce. I had countless discussions with Ross regarding the issues of the conflicts and argued strenuously that we move forward on the motion. On several occasions I asked Ross why he would not permit me to simply talk to the client about the conflicts issues, especially since I had come to learn that Ross too had been represented by Tober. I could not understand why Ross was so insistent in his refusal to seek to disqualify Tober. I became so frustrated and distraught over these issues that I began to confide in several people close to me about the ethical dilemma. Specifically, I talked to Megan Beauregard, as well as my then current husband and even a relative, all with the single goal of trying to find out why a senior partner at my firm would block the disclosure of a conflict of interest. Up until this point in time, I had only the highest regard for Ross. I worked extremely hard on his cases and felt fortunate to work with him. Gill was unaware of the conflicts of interest relating to Tober's prior representation of me, Ross, and Wigan and Norrie. However, from the inception of Tober's involvement, Gill was uneasy with having Tober involved in the divorce because just prior to Tober's appearance, the records of a therapist, Dr. Broussard, went mysteriously missing while Gill's wife was represented by attorneys Rona Wise and Matthew Kozel. As I mentioned, in December of 2007, Gill became uneasy with Ross as his attorney. Gill expressed concern that a plan existed between Ross and Tober to build a divorce case excessively. Gill was concerned that Ross did not want to have any contact with him. On numerous occasions, I continued to inform Ross that Gill was uneasy with Tober's involvement and was likewise uneasy with Ross's representation of him. I implored Ross to speak with Gill regarding Gill's concerns. However, Ross did not want to deal with the issue of whether a conflict existed by virtue of Tober's involvement and Ross would not speak with Gill. In Ross's opinion, no conflicts of interest existed by virtue of Tober's involvement. Ross never discussed with me the subject of Tober's prior representation of him. Again, I could not understand why Ross seemed to be fighting not to move to disqualify Tober. During this time period, the global economic crisis had begun, and there were numerous infirm discussions about rainmaking and billing clients. It became clear to me that I was being set up for something, and that if anything went wrong with the divorce, I would be blamed. Indeed, I knew that eventually the aforementioned conflicts of interest would lead to real problems with the client. I informed Tober of the motion, and it was clear that he was troubled by it. For example, at a court hearing following having advised Tober of the motion, 
Tober appeared to be trying to intimidate me by standing uncomfortably close to me, scowling and generally looking threatening. I also began to realize that Ross's behavior in litigation style became unusual. For example, Ross informed me that if and when Sarah Gill's deposition would go forward, he would aggressively explore incidents of sexual abuse she suffered in her past. Doing so, however, would not advance the interest of Gill nor be relevant to any issues in the case. It was also out of Ross's character to engage in such lines of inquiry. It then became obvious to me that this line of inquiry would only be used to delay the litigation by forcing Tober to stop the deposition. Indeed, Ross was so committed to preventing the deposition of Sarah Gill in order to allow the extremely lucrative, approximately $100,000 per month case to continue, that he told me that Sarah Gill would never sit for a deposition. Ross said that either Ross or Tober would feign a heart attack or some other medical problem in order to stop the deposition. Ross told me multiple times that Sarah Gill's deposition was simply not going to happen. Meanwhile, it seemed as though every effort I made to advance the case was being thwarted. For example, I tried for many months to secure the deposition of the opposing party, Sarah Gill. Yet, when I would discuss this with Ross, he seemed unconcerned that we were unable to secure the deposition. Likewise, as discussed below, Ross was unconcerned and uninterested in the mysterious unavailability of Dr. Broussard's records. While Ross and I had worked closely together for years, there was now obviously sharp tension between us and he was beginning to communicate less with me. I began to believe that Tober and Ross were in constant communication and were conspiring to frustrate the case from being advanced to closure. During this time frame, Wigan and Nori's financial challenges became more acute. For example, there were no bonuses distributed at the end of 2008 and the litigation activity in the firm had declined precipitously. The firm had many meetings regarding its financial challenges and the economic slowdown generally in the legal profession during this economic recession. As the case continued, it became clear to me that anything concerning the case which I would tell Ross would soon be learned by Tober. I concluded that Ross was not representing the best interest of the client, but instead was acting in collaboration with Tober to continue the case and continue the sizable monthly legal fees being paid by Gill. Despite all the fees and my best efforts, depositions had been blocked or thwarted, and other depositions, such as Sarah Gill's, as noted above, surely would not take place under Ross's watch. I no longer trusted Ross. I stayed out of the office as much as possible. Occasionally, Ross would call me and inquire about the case. His most common question was to inquire about the client's current thinking. Through my conduct in the case, I began to make it clear to Ross that I would not be a party to what I saw as unethical conduct, and this created greater distance between me and Ross. Eventually, this friction was expressed in an email response that I had sent to Ross. He had asked me, in an email, to engage in some ethically questionable conduct, and I responded that I would not do it. By this point, I was close to leaving the firm. I did express to Ross the client's displeasure with the case, the lack of depositions, and other related issues. I informed Ross that the client wanted to interview other law firms. I soon interviewed William Levine of Lee and Levine in Boston, Massachusetts, as potential successor counsel to Wigan and Norrie. I explained to Levine that depositions had not been conducted, that discovery efforts were being thwarted by Tober, without resistance from Ross, and that we had not obtained the therapy records of Sarah Gill. I said that I needed to find successor counsel who could properly represent Gill's interests. I also informed Levine about Ross's conflict given Tober's involvement and Ross's apparent efforts to force the expensive case to continue by delaying necessary proceedings among other things. They listened to what I had to say and agreed to a second meeting. After listening intently to the challenges I was facing in representing Gill, Levine advised me that the situation would not likely end well with Wigan and Nori. He then gave me the name of another lawyer with an expertise in ethics. That lawyer, who also listened intently as to what I had to say, advised me to leave the law firm of Wigan and Nori. As for the therapy records of Sarah Gill, they had been in custody of her therapist, Dr. Broussard. At various times, Dr. Broussard's office had represented that the records didn't exist due to one, a water and flood problem, two, a fire, and three, an accidental shredding by Dr. Broussard's secretary. Broussard's office even stated that the records might be in storage. Ross rejected my efforts to challenge in court these suspect and inconsistent grounds for allegedly not having medical records. 
I came to the conclusion that Dr. Broussard's records may not, in fact, have been destroyed, given my review of the records of Dr. Garber, which note that he reviewed Dr. Broussard's records in which detail a conversation Dr. Garber had with Dr. Broussard, wherein Dr. Broussard acknowledges the existence of the records. From time to time I had heard Ross make highly derogatory comments about Gill. This was unusual as he typically did not make such comments about his own clients. Later in the case, as I began to understand what was happening between Ross and Tober, I reflected upon the fact that Ross strongly encouraged me to communicate with Tober by telephone rather than in writing, even insisting that I do so even though every phone conversation I had with Tober would subsequently be misrepresented by Tober, leading to follow-up letters, disputes, delay, and more legal fees. For this reason, I had long preferred to communicate with Tober in writing so as to eliminate such unnecessary work and delay. Ross never explained to me his rationale for why I should only communicate with Tober via telephone and not in writing. At some point toward the very end of my relationship with Wigan and Nori, I told Ross that I know what's going on here. I recall making a statement along the lines of, how much money do you need? I gave my notice to Wigan and Nori, advising them that I would be leaving the firm. Thank you for watching this episode of Speak Up. We also want to thank our sponsor, Center for Redress of Grievances, LLC. You can reach them at www.centerforredress.com. If you want more information about Speak Up or want to be a guest, you have something to say, contact us at speakupnh at gmail.com. And thanks for watching. Until next week. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.